Hello again, everyone. This is Professor Casey. Today we're discussing the second half of Chapter 6. Uh, now that we've kind of gotten through the first uh, year or two of the establishment of the United States, now we can actually begin to discuss uh, the very first presidential administrations. Okay? And of course, specifically here, we have George Washington and we have John Adams. Okay? Um, now this first um, epoch, you could call it here, in U.S. history when it comes to the first few presidents is known as the Federalist Era. Okay, and it's called that because this is really the um, the first political party to gain control of uh, of the office of the president. Okay, um, George Washington himself did not count for any political party because he actually didn't, never joined one. Okay, um, it's not really until John Adams comes into office that we see federalism really begin to take over. Um, but it's called the Federalist Era again, not just for that reason, but also because. This is the beginning of the period when federalism as a political theory actually begins to be put into practice, okay? And federalism, remember we talked about in the first uh, half of this chapter, has to do specifically just with the three branches of government, okay? And them actually being put into play, okay? So we have a national government with the three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and then we still have state and local governments as well, okay? And remember, all of this is still in its fledgling state, okay? So um, just because the United States has actually become established as a country now doesn't mean that everything is okay, right? Doesn't mean everything is going to run very smoothly. So we'll start to see how some of this actually plays out now. So now that we've gotten through the first few years of the United States actually existing as a country, okay, um, just because 1776, remember, was the year that, of course, we, you know, firmly established independence in the eyes of, you know, of the people of, of this particular country before it actually becomes a country, uh, doesn't mean that the rest of the world did. Okay, so it took us until 1783 to actually uh, be recognized as independent in the eyes of the rest of the world. Um, and even from then, the actual government of the United States with an acting president doesn't even take over for another six years. Okay, so it takes several years in the interim there to actually build all of this up. Okay. And so now that we're getting into the actual first decade of a presidential administration, um, this is a time that is sometimes referred to as the age of passion, okay, because we have um, a whole lot of problems going on in this country, okay. We have um, people who are already rebelling against this new government, okay. We have people who are threatening to secede from the Union already, okay, before you know, any thoughts of a civil war ever come into mind, okay? We have plenty of tensions with the rest of the world in terms of European powers, in terms of Great Britain and France and Spain, um, and there's all kinds of foreign wars that are beginning now, some of them even using the American Revolution as a template, okay? Uh, and of course, there's plenty of internal political strife as well. So we've already talked about the two political parties that are established in the country, but we'll go ahead and get into a little bit more detail here. First group, of course, is called the Democratic Republicans. Okay, and this is led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, two of the authors of the Constitution. Now, Democratic Republicans, uh, remember, this seems like a little bit of a, an oxymoron compared to the political parties of today, because today these two, this is separated into two political parties: the Democrats and the Republicans. Okay, but the original initial form of this. Um, uh, are sometimes called Jeffersonian Republicans or simply Republicans, okay? And the whole idea of what Republicans in this particular instance believe in is uh, living in a republic where democracy is used exclusively, okay? So where everybody has equal rights, okay? Everybody has a voice in uh, how the government should be run and so forth. And again, it suffers from a lot of cognitive dissonance because we still have individuals like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington who own slaves, okay? And um, the Republican Party in this particular case, the Democratic Republicans, that is, uh, are primarily located in the South, okay? It's usually the agrarian aspect of American society that embodies this, the quote-unquote common people, okay? Um, so again, it's primarily the Southerners who are in, uh, in on this, and they want the country to be specifically agricultural, okay, and dedicated to this idea of uh, Republican values, basically where everybody in the country is essentially a gentleman farmer uh, who is, you know, living kind of the simple life in this almost utopian ideal uh, where there really is no political strife, right? Everybody kind of gets along with each other, and everybody has an equal say, okay? It sounds pretty nice on paper. 
but it doesn't exactly play out the way they expect it to. Um, for one thing, they really don't like the idea of a national government. They think that, you know, we've already, uh, we've been there and we've done that with Great Britain, right? We've seen what a national government can do, right, when it falls into the wrong hands. Um, they're much more um, interested in seeing states' rights come to the forefront. And again, over time, this ends up becoming the, the view of the South, specifically once we get into the Civil War, although it's that particular reason uh, accompanied with slavery that really gets us into the Civil War. Um, the uh, Democratic Republicans also want a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Basically, don't try to bend the words, don't try to bend what we say. Everything we have written down is exactly the way we want it. We don't want it to change. And the whole idea here, too, again, is the belief in the common people and faith in the common people to make the right decisions. Okay, they. They believe that you know these people have suffered enough under the tyranny of England that they are uh, more than capable of being able to make decisions that are going to benefit the country. Now, on the other side of the aisle, we have the Federalists. Okay, and this is why you know this era is called the Federalist era. Now, the Federalists are led by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. Remember, like I said, John Adams is the first uh, president to actually side with a specific political party. Washington, again, does not side with either one of these parties. Now, the Federalists, again, are geographically located in the north. Okay, So the country is already divided along north and south lines here when it comes to political parties, even from the very beginning. Okay, Now, the Federalists like the idea of urban life. Right. They like the idea of having cities, in industry, commercial growth, right? They're more merchant oriented. Um, most of the aspects of the Industrial Revolution begin in the North, or at least affect the North more, okay, disproportionately. And they are basically everything that the Democratic Republicans are not when it comes to political ideas. They like the idea of a strong national government. Uh, they, they like the idea of a flexible interpretation of the Constitution, okay? And that specific aspect of it with regards to the Constitution is good in a certain way because it allows for things to change, okay? It looks at things in the long term in that regard, okay? Realizes that we're living at this point in a world that is actively changing on a regular basis, and eventually things are going to come along that we don't have precedence for, okay? And so that's why the Constitution gains so many amendments over the of the next few centuries this is because um, you know we, we have this particular institution put into place here. Now the thing that works against the Federalists here and what causes people to really uh, look at them as being um, you know not having the nation's best interest at heart at least in the eyes of the South anyway is that they don't trust the common people. Okay? They don't like the idea of commoners making all the decisions for everybody. They say that the, the common people are too quote turbulent and too changing. Okay. Um, they think that if we allow the common people uh, to take hold of the reins of the country, then it can be very easy for people to disagree too much and for us to get involved in wars and all this kind of stuff. Okay. And I, uh, ironically here, the Federalists are the ones that end up kind of going that particular route with things. Um, but the Federalists have this idea that the people who run the government should be the quote-unquote better men. Okay. We should have a small group of people who are educated, intelligent, and adept enough to be able to do this and be trusted by the common people to do what's right. Okay, And again, it causes the common people to mistrust them because basically the Federalists are saying, you know, put your life in our hands and we'll do everything right by you. Okay, So it's, uh, it's basically asking the people to put a lot of faith in a small group of people, not too dissimilar to what happened with England before. All right, so now we finally get to our very first presidential administration in U.S. history under, of course, George Washington. Now, George Washington is not actually sworn in as president until March of 1789. Okay, So remember, 1783 is the year that the United States was actually officially recognized by the government of England. Okay, So there's a full six-year interim between the official re recognition of the country and George Washington being sworn in. Okay, so in that six-year interim, it takes us this long to actually build a government. So there is no real full-fledged government in existence yet, okay, until Washington comes into play. We still have the Confederation government in place, um, but there's really no uh, official court system, right? We've just, have, you know, barely gotten a constitution adopted, ratified, and so forth. So now we actually finally have this period of time 
where a president comes into play. And in his cabinet, we have John Adams as our vice president. Okay. We have Thomas Jefferson as the head of the Department of State, right? He's the Secretary of State. We have Alexander Hamilton as the Department of the Treasury head, right? He's the Secretary of the Treasury. And we have John Jay as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Okay. This is still before um, a judicial branch is, you know, fully designated with a full-sized court. Okay? So this is Washington's cabinet, right? Washington and four other men, and that's the entire executive branch at this point. Okay. Uh, in the present day, I mean, the, this number is a skeleton crew of a skeleton crew by comparison. Okay. There are so many people, so many working parts involved in the executive branch of government today. Now, the next thing that comes along is the Bill of Rights. Okay. And this is eventually whittled down to 10 rights, okay? Initially, there were 20 rights that people um, had to vote on, had to weed things out. Um, I don't know if an actual full list of those original 20 still exists anywhere. Um, I know it was initially whittled down to 12. Um, uh, two of those rights were eventually taken out, specifically because they didn't really pertain to everyone in the country. It had to do with how Congress was to be paid, um, scheduling, and that sort of thing. Um, but we finally whittle it down to an official Ten Amendments in 1791. Okay? And of course, people are pretty familiar with some of these. Okay? You hear people talking about them all the time in news and politics and so forth, but we'll have a brief little review of them here. Okay? The first one, of course, uh, is the one that most people are familiar with, the First Amendment, okay? the right to speech, assembly, religion, and the press. Okay? And all four of these specifically have to do with the rights that were denied to the American people by England. Okay? And so most of the, the rights that you see listed in the Bill of Rights are things that uh, caused the most problems during the Revolution and Im immediately before. Okay? Um, England tried its best to censor people's speech and the press in particular, okay, just because um, they, you know, viewed this as being too incendiary, right? If you give people uh, complete freedom of how they want to speak with one another, how they want to speak about the government, what they, you know, produce, what they print, and so forth, it can lead to, um, you know, a, a potential revolution all over again, okay? So immediately America decides it wants to grant this to all people, okay? Right to assembly goes along with that as well, because uh, England would look at a even a small gathering of people as potentially being a meeting of subversion, right, to basically make some kind of a plot against the government, okay? So England was very, very paranoid, as you can imagine, okay? And of course, today, you can have a meeting of, you know, a, a certain number of people and no one really bats an eye at it. Um, when it comes to religion here, this is a little bit of a trickier situation here because Religion at this particular point in time, and even to a certain extent today, this doesn't necessarily extend all the way to all religions everywhere. Okay, um, and and I say that not you know uh, in an official capacity, yes, you could interpret that as it you know being extending to all religions everywhere. Um, strictly speaking, if we're looking at what the Democratic Republicans are looking at at this, religion could extend to everything. Um, the Federalists would look at this and probably say something along the lines of uh, any socially acceptable religion. Okay? So in other words, uh, you can practice any form of Christianity that you wanted. Let's put it that way. Okay? Um, even certain uh, religious practices like Judaism okay, weren't actually um, able to be practiced in public really until we get to 1791, okay? until the Bill of Rights comes along. Um, and even then, there was no guarantee that you weren't going to be persecuted for it, right? The law might not persecute you, but there's nothing to prevent everyone else around you from persecuting you. And again, this still continues even into modern day, okay? We see uh, all kinds of religions that are still persecuted by this. A lot of Eastern religions, Islam included in that, um, and even, of course, pre-Christian religions are still involved in this to a certain extent as well, okay? So again, this is a, a, a very... Um, open interpreted, open interpretation going on here for this particular one. Okay? And of course, the First Amendment is what uh, everybody brings up when it comes to individual rights being infringed upon in the country. Okay? The second one that's most well known here, of course, is the Second um, Amendment, right? The right to own firearms of some kind. And this is still a major controversy in the 21st century, um, simply because of all the gun violence we've seen in the past, you know, 20 years or so. Okay. 
Um, the right to own firearms, of course, is something where, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, depending on what your political views are, um, this can be extremely incendiary or it can be something, um, you know, extremely down to a lull, okay? Um, the whole idea with this, too, is something that relates to what the uh, individuals involved in the revolution experienced, okay? England was willing to uh, seize control of firearms, stockpiling weapons and stuff against the people uh, in the country. And so for a farmer to be able to own a musket in order to protect himself and his family against a government that was potentially spiraling out of control, again, was very, very appealing at the time, okay? Um, and, of course, this is supposed to be a fail-safe of some kind, okay? If the government is plotting against you somehow, um, you know, arming yourself, keeping yourself and your family safe, sounds appealing, okay? But it depends on, you know, what your point of view is, right? Is the government actually against you? Is it on your side? Again, this is a, a major, major debate that people still continue all the way to today, okay? So whatever your views are with this, that's what it pertains to. The Third Amendment is the right to refuse to house soldiers, and this is almost exclusively uh, to do with people's experience in the Revolution as well. Okay, you really don't hear anything about the Third Amendment um, hardly at all today. Okay. In fact, I can't think of a single instance where this is being brought up. Uh, it might have been brought up at some point during the Vietnam War, Okay, but even then, it's a, a bit of a stretch. Um, and of course, this had to do with the quartering acts that we had England passing down to American colonists, right? Um, people would be forced by law to house a soldier, a British soldier, in their home at their own expense, okay? So if you had a soldier come knocking at your door, legally, you were, uh, your only option was to allow them in, give them food, board, and so forth, okay? If you pushed them away and said no, you could have your home seized and everything else, okay? So... Um, this is, again, putting a fail-safe in place immediately saying the government doesn't have the right to do this. And again, I cannot think of a single instance uh, in, in modern history where this has ever been infringed upon. Fourth Amendment goes along with that to a certain extent. Um, this is supposed to grant everyone in the country um, equal rights when it comes to unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay? Um, and there's plenty of issues where this has been infringed upon as well. Okay? We've seen issues... Uh, ranging from, um, you know, suspicion by the government of illegal activity, prejudice certainly plays into this a uh, massive amount, as we've seen. Um, but this has to do with the fact that if a, a government official or a law enforcement officer um, has a specific um, amount of paperwork, a document, a warrant, in fact, to be able to search your home, your property, um, and potentially seize anything, right, on behalf of the government, then they're allowed to do it, okay? But only if the paperwork and the right to do it is there, okay? In other words, if you allow a police officer to come into your home and there is an illegal substance sitting out in the open, um, unless they, uh, are, you know, have some kind of paperwork or some kind of a reasonable, um, you know, means of seizing it and seizing you in, in the process, um, they're, they're not allowed to. Okay, so there's there's all kinds of ways that this is bent and distorted um, and and has been in, in the 20th century especially, but um, the, and there's an entire history involved with this. Um, but this is something where, uh, again, this extends to a certain extent past what um, happens in the present and all the way back again to the revolution time period, okay, where England was basically able to say, you know, again, if you refuse to house a soldier, for instance, you might have your property seized, okay, or if you... Uh, are not a loyalist to the English crown, you might have your property seized. Okay? We might seize you and your family, sell them into indentured servitude or something along those lines. Okay? So it's just basically saying the government doesn't have the right to do any of these things without justifiable cause. Fifth Amendment, of course, is another one that people are familiar with. If you've ever watched any kind of uh, court procedural TV show, Law and Order, for instance, or anything like that, uh, you have the right to due process of law, right? If you are um, convicted of a crime or anything like that, right? If you have, you know, you go through the process of being indicted, uh, having a trial, right? And all these kinds of things, going through the entire due process from arrest to conviction, okay? Um, you also have the right against self-incrimination. That's what, you know, whenever someone says, I plead the fifth, 
right? That's what they're talking about, okay? If you're pleading the fifth on something that's saying that you're not willing to um, point the finger at yourself as being guilty of something, okay? So people use this jokingly from time to time, but that's what it refers to, okay? They don't want to admit guilt of any kind. And you also have the right against double jeopardy. Okay, and double jeopardy means that if you go through the process of law, okay, if you are arrested for something, you go through a trial, you get all the way to the end, and um, you are released, right? You're not convicted of something. You're found innocent. You cannot be tried for that same alleged crime a second time, okay? So that's basically what double jeopardy means. The Sixth um, Amendment here says that you have the right to a speedy public trial with an attorney, okay, and you have the right to face your accusers, okay. Uh, so in other words, if you are put on trial, you have the right to an attorney at all times, okay. This gets put into uh, the Miranda rights that are read to you when you're arrested, okay. Miranda didn't come around until the 20th century, okay. Um, and you also, again, you have the right to face your accusers. So if you're in a civil case and you have, you know, a neighbor who's accusing you of vandalizing their home or something, you have the right to speak to them openly in a public forum and figure things out right then and there, okay? Um, the, the most, uh, probably the most well-known version of this is something like Judge Judy, okay? We, we see this as reality TV, okay? And, you know, whether or not their, their acts and so forth is irrelevant here, but it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example. Right? You have two individuals involved on opposite ends of a civil case and a judge acting as an arbiter here. Okay? So that's essentially what the Sixth Amendment goes on. Seventh Amendment is the right to a trial by jury when it comes to common lawsuits. Okay, so again, if you are, uh, you know, someone charges you with a, a crime of some kind, again, vandalism, whatever, you know, murder, whatever the case may be, you have a right to a jury of your peers. Eighth uh, Amendment, of course, is the protection against cruel and unusual punishments, okay? And this has evolved over time, okay? Uh, once we've gotten past, um, you know, as the centuries have progressed, as, you know, forms of punishment have progressed, uh, as we've gone through uh, two world wars, okay, we've seen all kinds of different ways that individuals were punished were tortured in many instances. Uh, and so, you know, you're not allowed to be put into a, a certain situation where you're going to be, um, you know, uh, humiliated or whether you're going to be, um, uh, how can I put it, where you're going to be, you know, harmed excessively or anything like that, okay? In other words, um, and, and it also is something that has to do too with something that is not, um, uh, the punishment has to fit the crime, is what I'm getting at here. In other words, you can't be uh, executed for a parking violation, <laughs> okay? That's, that's uh, you know, in modern parlance, right? Something along those lines. And again, excessive bail goes along with this too. Again, if you, um, you know, if you're arrested for, you know, possession of an illegal substance or something, if a cop finds a joint of marijuana on you, for example, they, they can't give you a $10 million bail, okay, in, in today's equivalent. Okay, kind of goes along with that. Um, number nine basically covers the first eight, right? It says that uh, the rights that are listed are not going to infringe upon the rights reserved to everyone else. Okay, so in other words, uh, your rights are not going to end up infringing on everybody else's rights. And this is something that does get overlooked, okay? Uh, when it comes to, you know, the rights of, you know, freedom of speech, even the rights of firearms and so forth, um, people quite often miss the Ninth Amendment, okay? And if you, if you own a weapon, right, and you're waving it in everyone's face, then you're in violation of the Ninth Amendment, okay, because your rights are infringing on the rights of others. And finally, the Tenth Amendment basically says if anything that is not listed here is covered, right, then that is going to be handed over to the states or to the people themselves, okay. Um, and the Tenth Amendment gets used kind of as a... Um, uh, an emergency exit, I guess you could say, by the federal government many, many times, and especially where issues like slavery, um, you know, racist practices and so forth are concerned, okay? Uh, beginning from this period going well into the 20th and even the 21st century, okay? Uh, we, we have instances where they say, you know what, we're not going to make a decision about this, we're going to hand it off to the states and let them decide for themselves, okay? Um, so it's, it's kind of a way of passing the buck to a certain extent, okay, it's not always done with that particular spirit in mind, okay, but in many cases it ends up looking that way, okay. So in other words, if we're, if none of, you know, if, if you have an issue, it's not covered by the first nine amendments, then we hand it off to the states to decide. 
Now, the next thing we can talk about here are the economic reforms, because remember, the U.S. government, when it comes into full fruition, is in a pretty sorry state, economically speaking. Okay? Um, in 1776, of course, the first, the same year that we have the Declaration of Independence being signed, there's an author named uh, Adam Smith, he's a Scottish author, and he writes a book called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Okay, and this is something that is a, a major source of inspiration for Alexander Hamilton. Okay, and it's a full description of what a modern capitalist economy should look like. Okay. The guy writes a full template of this okay, and explains what the social benefits of, are of having a capitalist economy. Okay, Because up until now, right, most of the other countries in the world have had some kind of a mercantile economy. Okay, In other words, it's directly regulated by the government. Okay? The government has control of the means of production. It has the control over right, shipping lanes of, of all this stuff. Okay. But a capitalist economy says that the citizens themselves, private citizens, have the right to make the money, right, to own the means of production and so forth. Okay. And how you know, handing over that certain amount of trust to people is going to make for a better environment. And again, this is a, an open challenge to what uh, Great Britain and many other monarchies in the world have done. Okay, as is the very presence of the United States. Again, the entire government of the country and the entire political system is a brand new creature, right? It's something that's never been seen before. And this particular instance with the economy ends up following that pattern. Okay, so Hamilton looks at this and he decides that he is going to use this as an instruction manual, basically. Okay, he's going to put these theories into action and actually see if he can build up a brand new capitalist economy in the United States and see how it can help the country bounce back. Um, he says that it has become far too dependent on agriculture for one thing, for its own well-being. Okay? If America continues to rely on nothing but producing crops, okay, then we're not going to get anywhere. We're never going to be able to pay off our debts. We're only going to sink further and further into debt. Okay. And he says the future of the United States when it comes to making money is, uh, rely, you know, lies in trade, in banking, uh, finance, people investing in something, uh, and of course manufacturing, right? We're at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution here. And of course, the biggest economic barrier that America faces at this point is war debt. Okay? Again, we, we have you know, 20 years worth of uh, a national uh, debt in place here okay? that we have to get over before we can actually begin to prosper. Okay? And so there's all kinds of options as to what the, um, the government can begin to do, okay? right? put all different little aspects to work in order for things to bounce back. First thing, of course, that is extremely unpopular, as we've already said, is for the government to impose taxes and fees on, you know, specific businesses and or individuals. Okay, so in other words, raising taxes uh, just in general is something that the country does time and time again anytime a major war comes around. Levying tariffs is another thing, and again, this seems like it uh, seems counterintuitive because a tariff is anytime you're basically taxing an import of some kind. So if something is coming from England or from France or from some other country, when it arrives in the United States, uh, a tariff is put in place on, on it. Basically, um, uh, an individual has to pay or has to um, give up a, a certain portion of their proceeds in order to be able to sell that product here. Okay? So a tariff is basically, it's like a filter, right? You're filtering a certain amount of money out. Uh, or and, I mean, it's like paying taxes, right? Whenever you get your paycheck, right? You have a gross amount that you, you know, would be making overall, and then you have a net amount, right? right which is significantly smaller after you pay taxes and so forth. So that's basically what a tariff is here. Um, and tariffs become the, the first and really major source of income for the federal government and protection of American manufacturing, okay? Because once we start to see products that are made in America, um, it's, uh, it comes in a competition with foreign, you know, competitors, right? Anybody who makes something that is potentially better in England or France or somewhere else, once they bring it to the United States, they have to pay more to be able to sell it here. Okay, so they might not make as much money off of it. Okay, so it provides more incentive for people to buy American products. Okay, and again, this is used as an economic tool even into the present. 
Um, and again, this also allows American manufacturers to begin to charge higher prices for things. Okay, uh, if something is made here in America, right? Um, it, you know, they don't have to wait for it, right? You can actually, you know, make something here, get it sooner, right? In other words, you don't have to wait the six months or whatever it is that takes to get from Europe to the United States. And ultimately, this does end up hurting the Southern economy because the South becomes extremely reliant on imports from Europe. Okay. Most of the, the wealth and the goods and so forth, all the fancy clothes, uh, the furniture, whatever it may be, ends up coming from Europe in many cases. Okay. So once people start charging more money to buy those items, the South is not able to do it anymore. And again, they get hurt in the process. And it's not just, you know, consumer goods either. Um, you know, it can be food, it can be um, all kinds of things. Borrowing money uh, through selling interest paying government bonds is something else, right? So if people end up buying, um, you know, government bonds, they invest in the government, okay? Then once the government starts doing well over time, okay, then they get a paycheck, okay? They get a little bit of money back. Okay. And this is uh, another thing that ends up happening. Anytime there's a major war uh, going well into um, uh, well into World War II and even a little bit after, okay, people start selling war bonds uh, to um, to basically cover the cost of the war. Right? People invest in the government, and if and when the government wins the war, <laughs> okay, they end up getting a little bit of a, a residual paycheck back. And of course, printing paper money in the country as well, right? Um, again, this is something that is kind of in its fledgling state and money at this point is not really worth a whole lot because there's not really any collateral to back it up. Okay? We don't really have any gold or silver coins to speak of here. Um, so we have to eventually mine for gold and silver okay, to be able to cover the cost of this. So between 1790 and 1791, Hamilton begins to write several different little reports, and he writes two that he calls reports on public credit, okay? And this is his proposal for how the war debt should be repaid, okay? He says, number one, we need to sell government bonds to people willing to invest, okay? Anybody who is willing to give us a little bit of money, they're basically, uh, we're, we're getting a loan from the people, in other words, okay? And over time, right, interest ends up accruing, and once we're doing well, we can pay them back. Um, federal government actually begins to repay the state's debts, okay? Uh, and this is something that is very controversial, right? It's a, a, an issue where people don't really fully agree that the government should have, uh, should do anything on behalf of the states, okay? The federal government and state governments are still at odds with one another at this point. Um, and uh, Hamilton calls this the, the price of liberty. He says, you know what, we, we owe it this much to, you know, to gain the trust of the people to be able to do this. Um, and again, this is not very popular, right, because it's an extremely complex proposal, right, because each state owes more than another one, uh, their economies are different, right, their, their reasons are different, um, and this ends up causing Hamilton and James Madison to break away from one another, right, they, they actually get into such a big disagreement over this um, that they, um, you know, they, they just don't get along very well after this, okay, so states' debts are not fully balanced uh, at this point. Um, and, you know, several different states do manage to pay off most of their debts, right? Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Maryland, uh, but the northern states are the ones that are still in the heaviest debt, uh, and quite frankly, because most of the war is fought in that region, okay? Um, and uh, again, their economies are the ones that are hurt the most, okay, because they're shipping economies. Hamilton finally convinces um, Madison and Jefferson here to move the capital to Philadelphia for a period of 10 years while they end up constructing a brand new, what they call a federal district between Maryland and Virginia, okay? Uh, so again, the, the capital moves from New York to Philadelphia. And then in 1800, we have the establishment of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., okay? And Hamilton's ideas work. Okay, this, this whole book by Adam Smith ends up being a success, right? When put into practice, this actually ends up paying off, okay? People very quickly begin to publish or uh, purchase government bonds. The war debts gradually get paid off, okay? Operating expenses are fully covered. And when they start getting new loans even from European governments, right? Once people start to realize that the U.S. is finally open for business, other countries are willing to do business with us, okay? 
And of course, taxes themselves are unpopular at any given point in time, okay? But they end up being necessary in order to bridge the gap in some cases. So everything from carriages to salt to liquor, right? Any kind of commodity you can get, right? Ends up having to be taxed. But again, it ends up causing the economy to bounce back. And by 1794, America has a higher credit rating than any nation in Europe, okay? So just in that short amount of time, America bounces back that much. Now, the next thing that we can look at here is the idea of a national bank. Okay? Because Washington, when he looks at the government itself, he realizes that Hamilton's ideas are so successful that in order for this country to actually prosper and for other countries to actually look up to us the way that America wants to happen, we need to give more priority to the Treasury. Okay? Uh, and remember, the State Department only has five people operating in it, okay? And Washington actually allocates money and manpower and so forth to grant a 40-member staff to the Treasury over the State Department staff of only five, okay? And Hamilton actually begins to call for the establishment of a national bank, okay? Uh, this is something that uh, if we're going to have everybody in the country being involved in a capitalist economy, we need to have banks that are open to the common people, okay? And this is going to provide a location for all public commerce to happen, okay? It's going to secure federal funds. It's going to issue currency that's going to be available to everybody in the country, right? A national currency of some kind, okay? Remember, because at this point, anytime paper money has been printed in the country, sometimes it's only uh, available in one state or another, okay? So Pennsylvania money, no good in Connecticut, right? That kind of thing. Um, and it also is going to allow uh, loans to circulate wealth into the economy as well, okay? So it's, it basically acts as a, a, another filter of sorts. Um, and the biggest problem with this, and something that constantly gets brought up well into the 19th century, is that the, the National Bank could potentially be a symbol of corruption, okay? Uh, and it becomes the first constitutional debate that we have in the country between the legislative and executive branches, right? Are we going to give over people's finances to a national government, right? Is that something that we want to happen, right? Will the government actually seize people's funds, right, and actually uh, disenfranchise them? And so the first bank of the United States is established in Philadelphia in 1791, and that's the image that you see in the background here. Okay. Holds the government's funds, pays all of its bills, and it provides loans to the federal government and to other banks in order to promote economic development of some kind. It also manages the money supply in the country, right? It acts as the mint, so to speak, okay? And it regulates any state chartered banks when it comes to issuing paper money. So in other words, it monitors what state banks are doing. And if it realizes that state banks are printing state specific money, right? It stops them and says, no, you have to print money that's good everywhere. And by 1800, we have branches that are established in four cities across the country. What, how small the country is at that point. Now, the next thing, too, when it comes to Hamilton's plan here is to look at um, the economy itself and how manufacturing can play in. Because, again, we are at the very beginning here of the Industrial Revolution, okay? Um, 1791, he presents a report on manufacturers and says that the government needs to look at promoting industry, okay? If people are investing in the government, then the government needs to invest in industry, okay, to look at the long term. And we need to diversify the economy. Again, we don't need to depend so much on the agricultural aspect of things, okay? And we don't need to depend on imports from other countries, okay? If we're going to become self-sufficient, then we actually need to practice what we preach, okay? We need to actually begin uh, manufacturing goods here in the country. We need to have full-fledged industry going on here. Um, and he begins to say that we need to have skilled immigration as well, okay? We don't need to just... Um, you know, open the doors for anybody to come in. We need to actually promote people with skill sets to come here, okay? And provide more and more employment for women and children as well, okay? This is still before child labor laws have been put into place. Uh, we're still a good, um, about a good hundred years away from when that actually begins to show up on the horizon. And all financial incentives that are going to be involved here are going to be granted to certain key industries, right? Things that are going to cause the economy uh, to, to prosper over time. So wool, cotton cloth, glass for windows, right? Anything that's going to be used more and more often is going to be given a certain financial incentive. 
Um, and also, this includes um, government-funded transportation projects, right? Infrastructure of some kind. So the construction of roads, of canals, of harbors for ships. And Hamilton manages to get a lot of investments from Europe and even extends trade into China. Okay, so this is something where, uh, you know, we, we didn't have this kind of uh, extension uh, yet. Okay, we haven't even reached the Pacific Ocean when it comes to um, even getting across the full continent of North America. Okay, and Hamilton has reached all the way around the other side of the world here. And of course, not surprisingly, the South is not really um, in, in favor of this, right? They think that their way of life, their economy is going to be threatened by this, that they're going to eventually be outmoded. And frankly, they're right. Okay, um, the the country is already looking at other alternatives when it comes to um, promoting its economy. Okay, and so for the South to try to you know promote agriculture and so forth, again, it's it's beating a dead horse almost here. Um, and it creates a, a personal feud here between Hamilton, who is part of the Federalists, and Jefferson, right, who is one of the Democratic Republicans. Okay, um, and the two of them don't really get along. For, for most of the rest of their lives here, okay? Uh, they, uh, they have too many differing opinions here about how the country should be run uh, and what its long-term um, effects are gonna be. Hamilton, for example, says we need to model the United States on Britain, on its ways of success, and Jefferson says we need to model it on France, okay? France is still operating as an agricultural economy at this point, and Great Britain is finally beginning to industrialize a little bit more. Now, looking back again at the two um, political parties here, kind of how they begin to look at these things, you, you might already be able to get a little bit of a pattern here going along, but I'll just give a little bit more explanation here. Uh, again, Hamilton himself is one of the Federalists, right? He likes this idea of a strong central government that is more committed to economic growth here, okay? So this falls in line directly with what the Federalists want, okay? This idea of promoting a diversified economy, right, with actually doing more than just growing crops, okay? They think it provides more social stability and it creates the possibility of national defense, okay? We can actually begin to manufacture weapons, uh, more advanced ships, hardware, and so forth uh, to defend ourselves, okay? And it's primarily located in New England. Again, this is where most of this manufacturing is taking place. And of course, the Democratic Republicans are headed still primarily by Madison and Jefferson, again, both of whom are slave owners, okay, and plantation owners. Um, and they're more worried about threats to individual freedoms, what they believe uh, is the state's rights being infringed upon by a national government. And again, they're located in the South, okay? And these, this narrative of what Madison and Jefferson are presenting here is very, very similar to what we see the South beginning to um, profess once we get closer to the Civil War in the 1860s, okay? It's still the issue of, you know, believing that the North is somehow infringing on the rights of the South, but in reality, it's the South not willing to progress, okay? Not willing to move past a, a, a more and more outmoded and outdated form of making money. To add more complications here, in 1789, we get the beginning of the French Revolution, okay? Um, and this happens because we have the, the reign of Louis XVI, who believes himself to be an absolute monarch, okay? And when I say absolute, I mean that he is not answerable to anyone else, okay? He's an autocrat. An autocrat means you have a, a ruler who is not willing to listen to anyone's advice but their own, okay? Uh, and so Louis XVI says that he is, um, you know, he's not willing to listen to the people, and so the people who are starving at this point, by the way, Bread prices are skyrocketing, people are eating rotten food. Um, this ends up backfiring on him, okay? And the people actually rise up and attack the monarchy. They physically attack um, the royalty, they attack people who are uh, very wealthy, and you actually get mobs of peasants literally going into palaces and dragging the uh, aristocrats out and executing them out in the open, okay? So this is a very, very bloody and very uh, gritty revolution compared to the United States. And Jefferson and the Republicans actually support this, okay, because in a certain regard, the French are actually modeling, again, their revolution in some aspects on what America has done, 
Okay, and uh, to have this kind of legacy extend to something as bloody and violent as the French Revolution doesn't look very well to everybody, right? Not everybody in the country agrees with uh, with Jefferson's assessment of this. Now, in 1792, Washington is actually unanimously elected for a second term, okay? No one else runs against him here. And the French Revolution begins to escalate more and more and more, and now it's potentially going to involve the United States, okay? Um, and the reason it does is because, remember, during the American Revolution, France came to our aid, okay? And so we're almost in debt to France here, okay? It's almost as if France is trying to call in a favor, okay, and say, you, we helped you, now we need you to come help us, okay? Um, and France, its situation becomes more and more dire because um, the year before Washington's second term in office begins, um, the monarchies of Prussia and Austria, which again, in this case, Austria is still um, a, a separate nation today. Prussia used to in, include parts of Germany. Okay? Um, these monarchies end up invading France once they realize that the monarchy has been toppled to try to take over the power vacuum. Okay? Uh, and French revolutionaries now become much more patriotic, and now they're not just fighting a war from within, now they're fighting enemies coming from other countries. So in 1793, the group called the Jacobins, okay, this is the French revolutionaries who are the most radical. These are the ones who are actually dragging people out and having them executed. They end up executing Louis XVI, the monarch, okay. Uh, they execute the queen and hundreds of aristocrats, priests. Um, this is also the same period where Marie Antoinette is executed as well, okay, so um, very infamously. Okay? So this is a, a period where no one who has money is saved. Okay. Uh, and no one who has political power is safe either. Okay, so the Jacobins are are really going after just about everybody, and again they're going after priests as well because the priests and the clergy and the church are all kind of uh, embedded in this um, this life of luxury. Okay, you have priests and bishops and cardinals who are uh, you know fathering children. They're you know they're attending orgies. They're they're getting involved in just about everything. Okay, everything that uh, the people themselves are not granted access to, for, for better or for worse. And the Jacobins are actually trying to promote democracy, okay? And again, they're doing it by brute force here, but they're still, they still have it at their core. They like the idea of having religious toleration, which again is something that France is not really hearing about up until now, okay? France is still primarily a Catholic country. Um, and just simple human rights, right? Granting the right for people to live to have industry, to eat, right? All these kinds of things that the monarchy is, has denied them, okay? And, and total social equality, okay? We still have such a massive gap between the haves and the have-nots in France um, that, you know, once we have the Jacobins going in and dragging people out of their homes, um, they're, they're trying to bridge the gap, again, very, very forcefully, right? They're, they're paving it with blood as the mortar. Um, and they end up declaring war on Britain, ultimately, okay, and this le leads to a 22-year-long conflict, uh, again, with between England and France, and again, this is something that happens time and time and time and time again, okay, Britain and France are mortal enemies of one another uh, from 1066 all the way well into the time we get to World War I, okay, and from 1793 to 1794, we have a period that's known as the Reign of Terror, okay, and this is the, the height of the Jacobins, um, acts against the aristocracy, okay, uh, where we have thousands of people who are counter-revolutionary prisoners and priests executed en masse in many cases. This is where the guillotine gets its most exercise, okay, and the Jacobins are led by a man named Maximilien Robespierre, who you see here. Um, Robespierre is a, a very uh, intriguing character for all of his um, efforts involved in this, and again, the, the guillotine is something that is that becomes extremely popular here because it's a, a very quick and efficient way of, of executing people. Okay, it was actually uh, imagined by a doctor. Okay, um, and again, the guillotine, if, if, if you don't know, is a is a blade right that is dropped from a, a certain height, usually about ten or twelve feet, down to decapitate a person. Okay, and it's the quickest way of actually. If you have a long line of people that you're executing, right, it's the quickest way to do it, sharpen it, oil the blade, and move on, okay? 
um, quick side note when it comes to Robespierre, once he is actually caught and executed in 1794, okay, he is actually finally, uh, he meets his end at the guillotine, okay? Um, and his execution is actually pretty brutal. Uh, when he is captured uh, by the counter-revolution, he is actually, he tries to commit suicide, okay? He pulls a, a flintlock pistol out, uh, he's cornered in a room somewhere, pulls the pistol out, aims it at his head, and the gun misfires, okay, or he misses, one of the two. Flintlock pistols, by the way, were not very effective weapons, okay? Um, the, the little ball bearing that is shot, the bullet itself, could potentially fly off at an odd angle when it ex ex exits the barrel, okay? If it's not properly shaped and so forth, uh, it could fly off completely at a right angle and kill the person standing in front of you, okay? It's that bizarre. But either way, Robespierre, when he shoots the gun into his head, it actually ends up uh, going through his jaw and dislocates his jaw. And he doesn't die. Okay? The, when the people actually capture him, they bandage his jaw shut, okay? and they keep him in a prison awaiting execution, so they don't actually fully dress the wound. Um, when they do finally get him to the guillotine, okay? and there are actual eyewitness accounts of this that you can read about uh, out there on the internet if you choose, um, it's not for the, the weak-hearted, so fair warning here for this little um, description. Um, when Robespierre is finally brought up to the guillotine, uh, his head cannot fully fit through the hole in order to uh, for him to be beheaded, okay, because of the bandage. And so the executioner actually rips the bandage completely off of his head, which ends up dislocating his jaw, again, completely. So it's essentially dangling from his head. Um, and he has his head put through, and the other problem here, too, is that the executioner did not bother to actually sharpen or oil the blade before uh, Robespierre is actually executed, okay? And this was something that people actually would have to, some in some cases, bribe an executioner to do in these days, okay? If you wanted a quick death, you would pay the executioner a certain amount of money, they would oil the blade so it would drop quickly and with more force, okay? And they would sharpen it so it would actually go straight through, okay? If not, the blade would sometimes fall short, okay? Or if it was dull, it would not cut all the way through, okay? And you might have to have it cranked all the way back up and dropped a second or a third time, okay? So this is a very, very, really brutal way of being executed. And for Robespierre, he suffers through this, okay? The blade actually has to be dropped and risen and dropped again at least one more time, if not two more times. Um, and it actually ends up uh, being a, a very long and bloody execution for him. So again, for all the, the terror that he ends up inflicting on other people, he actually ends up meeting just as brutal an end himself. Now, while all of this is going on, remember, Thomas Jefferson is supporting this movement, okay? He believes this is something where um, the French actually have the right way of things, right? The people themselves. And Hamilton and Adams look at this and they say, this is an absolutely godless way of doing this, right? You are killing priests and you're actually supporting this, right? What are you thinking, right? You're, you're killing people who are representatives of a church, whether you agree with them or not, okay? And so Jefferson actually gains a, a reputation from this point forward, and even beginning with the, um, the Virginia Statutes on Religious Freedom of being an atheist, okay? Uh, and it, of course, at this time, being accused of being atheist was almost the equivalent of being accused of being a pedophile, okay? Or practicing witchcraft, right? It was something that was uh, a stain on your reputation as a, as a, you know, a public figure. And Jefferson, at best, was considered a deist, right? An individual who believed in a god that, you know, put the, the world in motion and so forth, but doesn't really intervene, okay? So for, for people to execute priests, in his mind, didn't really affect things in the long term, okay? And the U.S. throughout all this, while all these bloody, horrible things are going on, the U.S. tries its best to remain as neutral as possible and not get involved, okay? But at the same time, it's still engaging in trade with France and with Great Britain, kind of playing both ends from the middle here in the midst of this war, okay? In 1778, remember, we signed a treaty of alliance with France that says we were going to be a perpetual ally. So technically, we're already going back on that promise here. 1793, 
and at the height of the reign of terror, Washington declares that we're going to have a friendly neutrality position when it comes to the revolution. Okay. Um, he actually recognizes the revolutionary government, okay, which is a big deal. Okay, this is something that happens, uh, again, in politics time and time again from this point going all the way to the present. Anytime there is a major revolution that occurs, if, uh, if a revolutionary government or a leader is recognized by a foreign power, then it legitimizes it on the world stage. Okay, so the U.S. is really coming on down on the side of the revolution itself here. Okay, we're, we're, whether we say that we're trying to be neutral or not, by recognizing the revolution, we're basically saying it's legitimate. And we end up welcoming the French ambassador, Edmond Charles Genet, to the United States. And Genet immediately violates U.S. neutrality here by recruiting four privateer ships in South Carolina. Now, privateers, if you recall, if we go back a little bit to the Elizabethan era, privateers are basically legalized pirates. Okay, these are pirate ships that are being hired to go and invade uh, England. Okay, and you know they're getting he's getting them from the United States. Okay, uh, and this becomes something that borders on an international incident because remember we are still engaging in trade with Great Britain in the midst of all this. Okay, and the French are coming in around behind our backs and recruiting pirates from amongst us. Okay, and Jefferson is so humiliated by this by welcoming this guy here that he ends up resigning as Secretary of State. Okay, this is such a, a big incident here. And of course the tensions between the U.S. and the British end up growing. Um, beginning after this happens, okay? Uh, unsurprisingly, Britain is looking at this and saying, you know, really, we've been doing trade this whole time and now you're stabbing us in the back, right? We've, we've already fought a war with one another and now you're doing this. Um, and now our borders are beginning to be in dispute, okay? Um, Britain still, re you know, retains control of certain areas, okay, you know, kind of on our fringe areas here. Uh, so we still have Spain and uh, as far as our western border goes and part of our southern border. And British warships finally start to actually um, violate international law. Okay? They start seizing American ships that carry French goods. They start impressing sailors into service, okay? just like they did at the end of the revolution. And they even start to arm Native Americans living in the Ohio Valley and you know, stirring all that up again and telling them go attack American settlements, right? They've violated treaties with us, okay? And these are the types of things that end up leading us eventually into the War of 1812, okay? These are the reasons why the War of 1812 is essentially fought, right? It's almost a sequel to the American Revolution, right? It's the same basic issues, just unresolved conflicts. And finally, Chief Justice John Jay is actually sent to London to try to broker a settlement and try to smooth things over because it's evident that both sides here, both the United States and Great Britain, have gone back on their promises. Okay. And so we end up what's called Jay's Treaty. Okay. Uh, it says that America is not going to sell any more products to France when it comes to warship construction, so we're not going to give them nails or wood or anything like that. Great Britain is not going to be required to compensate U.S. citizens for any escaped slaves during the revolution in return. Okay? And this is a big, big thing. Okay? So for people living in the South in particular, um, John Jay really is um, doing Southerners a disservice here. And again, looking at slavery objectively, it's very difficult to do, I realize. In this particular instance, this is, you know, people are basically waiting around on a paycheck here. And not that the South is really hurting at this point, you understand, right? The South is where most of the wealth is actually accumulated, but it's basically saying, you know, you, you're owed this amount of money for, you know, however many slaves ended up escaping or were freed in the process, and now suddenly you're being told, don't wait on that paycheck anymore, it's not coming. So, and he does this, the, the thing that makes it the, the biggest problem is he does it without any kind of blessing from the people themselves. Okay, so again, it's it's the precedent of the government actually operating without the consent of the people. And Great Britain agrees to a few things. It says it's going to evacuate six forts in northwestern America by 1796. It's going to reimburse Americans for all ship and cargo seizure during the, the period of the reign of terror, okay, 1793 to 94. And it's going to grant U.S. merchants the right to trade with the British West Indies. Okay. So again, this works to the advantage of the U.S. and of Great Britain. 
And again, as you can imagine, the Republicans, right, the Democratic Republicans who are primarily located in the South are absolutely outraged by this, right? No one asked them, right? No one said, are you okay with not being, you know, you know, recompensed or whatever for all this. And it becomes the biggest crisis that Washington ends up facing during his presidency, right? The country ends up becoming more and more and more divided over the course of his second term in office. Um, and of course, this uh, could potentially devolve into civil war, and we could even still get into a war with Great Britain at this point. And the U.S. Army at this point has a standing army of only 672 men, okay, and no navy to speak of. Okay, we might have a few ships that have been commandeered, but that's about it. Okay, and so if England ends up declaring war on us or vice versa, it's going to be almost impossible for us to win. Now, to make matters worse, on the frontier, right, the western frontier, right, where the Appalachian Mountains are, we have more problems, okay? Uh, the Northwest Indian War begins the same year that the Reign of Terror does, okay? Uh, we have individuals like Mad Anthony Wayne, who are led into the Ohio River Valley. Uh, he ends up building Fort Greenville and ends up fighting several natives who are attacking settlements up and down the frontier. And again, most of this is being done at the behest of Great Britain, okay? It's a... It's a um, kind of a Cold War type situation, right? Where we don't exactly have British troops and American troops fighting each other, we have an intermediary force and the Native Americans fighting us. 1794, the Western Confederacy is the, the name that's given to the group of natives who band together to fight against the Americans, okay? And again, the natives have their own interests at heart here, right? They're trying to, they're still trying to kick the colonists off their lands, right? They're, you know, 100 plus years later here, nearly 200 years later. And they're still trying to get American settlers off their land. We have the Battle of Fallen Timbers that occurs in the same year. We have 2,000 natives from several different tribes that are supported by the British and Canadian militia fighting against the Americans. Okay? And the U.S. forces end up winning and building several different forts up and down the Ohio River Valley here to prevent the natives and the British from gaining any more territory. Okay? Treaty of Greenville the next year uh, causes the U.S. to purchase the Ohio, Detroit, and Chicago territories. Okay. So all of the, the northwestern territories where we have those states now, that's what is uh, granted here. Hamilton also puts a, a tax in 1791 on all distilled spirits. Okay. And this, of course, ends up igniting another big heavy protest because who, because who wants to pay a uh, tax on alcohol? Okay. And it leads to what is called the Whiskey Rebellion. Okay, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? Uh, people start to illegally distill whiskey, okay, and they do it so that they don't have to pay taxes. Okay, this is where we get corn liquor, moonshine, and all this stuff for the first time. And again, the backcountry relies on whiskey as its most valuable product, right? People who can distill corn liquor and, uh, you know, barley and all that kind of stuff down into whiskey and, and other spirits, right? They're making a bunch of money on this. Um, and of course, when Hamilton refuses to repeal this tax, right, we start to get people actually physically attacking tax collectors and U.S. Marshals, right, who come to collect. And so in 1794, we have an open rebellion that actually happens against the U.S. government in Pennsylvania. And this is the first time and really the only time that I can think of where this has actually happened. We have a sitting president in George Washington who actually leaves the White House, dons his full military gear and leads the army on horseback to confront these people in person. Okay. 12,500 troops follow Washington to Pennsylvania and he tells them in person to their face, stop it or I will stop it. Okay. Um, Henry Lee, also known as Light Horse Harry, ends up leading the U.S. forces okay, and he ends up dispersing the rebels. Right. So once they see Washington show up, they know things are about to go down and they decide to disperse. Um, and the government actually intervening here causes people to vote for the Democratic Republican Party more so than with the Federalists here, okay? So in other words, people are not willing to become violent here, they're just willing to support the other party, okay? Because remember, Hamilton is still a Federalist, okay? And people are beginning to associate Washington with the Federalist Party, even though he hasn't actually endorsed it, okay? So they're basically saying Washington is turning into a lackey, we're no longer willing to support him anymore. Okay. So Washington's days are essentially numbered by this point. And Thomas Pinckney is another individual here. He's a, another uh, general. He commands uh, the 
uh, U.S. forces in the South to actually um, convinces the Spanish here, that is, to acknowledge that we're going to put up a border uh, at the 31st parallel, right, allowing vessels to begin to trade on the Mississippi River again. So he basically says, you're allowed to continue to keep Florida, right, we're not going to actually try to get over from Georgia into your territory, but please allow us to use the Mississippi River, okay, just so we can actually continue to do business. Now, the two treaties between Jay and France and Pinckney and Spain uh, lead to westward expansion being allowed to continue, okay? Um, and we have new land policy debates opening up, right? Now that we actually have a federal government in place, what are we going to do with new lands, right? How are they going to actually be allocated? Federalists, of course, want to start charging higher prices, keep more power you know, centralized in the East and sell lands to speculators, right? Anybody who wants to use the land to do business. And Jefferson and Madison, though, want to sell it to settlers, right? To people who are actually going to go and live there and potentially use it for agricultural purposes. So again, political purposes filtering directly into an issue here. Land Act of 1796 here says that Congress is going to double the price of all federal land to two dollars an acre. <laughs> okay, so by by modern standards, of course, this is a dream come true, but back then it was still a lot of money. Half of all townships are sold in 640 acre sections for twelve hundred and eighty dollars. And the Land Act of 1800 eventually says that it's going to reduce the minimum parcel here from 640 acres to 320 okay, and spread payments out over four years. So basically, this is just keeping checks and balances when it comes to this type of thing. And if you are able to afford a down payment of $160, then you own a farm. And Daniel Boone, who we've talked about already, ends up leading thousands of settlers into the Kentucky Territory here. Okay? He ends up discovering uh, what the natives refer to as the Warrior's Path over the Appalachian Mountains. It's a small footpath that the Native Americans used. Uh, he discovers this in 1769 and ends up widening it over time, actually cultivates it, chips away the rock and so forth, to widen it into what is called the Wilderness Road in 1773. And over the course of the next 25 years, 300,000 people end up passing through this section and filtering into Kentucky. Okay, so this is how we get past that natural um, uh, bridge, really, of, of the Appalachian Mountains and getting into westward expansion and some more. Kentucky eventually is integrated into Virginia in 1780, but becomes its own state by 1792. And most of the people who go into this region, into the Appalachian Mountains, are Scots-Irish immigrants who come in from Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina. Uh, they go there for fertile land, for good hunting. Um, they end up clearing trees. They farm corn, melons, turnips. They raise a lot of livestock, and they distill corn liquor. <laughs> okay, and many of them don't leave. Okay, and this is where we get um, you know a lot of the the, the culture of quote unquote hillbilly culture in in the Appalachian Mountain region. Uh, many people are are still living there in some re really remote areas. In many ways, the same ways that their ancestors did 200 years before. Okay, they're, they're woodsmen, they, they raise animals, they hunt, they distill liquor, they do the whole, whole nine yards. Now, in 1796, Washington has the choice of actually running for a third term, but he looks at the state of politics in the United States and he says, I've had enough. He says, there, I haven't endorsed either political party, I'm already being accused of siding with one side or another, I'm not willing to continue. And so he has several different notches on his belt in terms of what he has actually accomplished here, uh, a lot of which is actually worth mentioning. He has managed to organize and maintain a brand new government and economy, right? something that has never been done anywhere else in the world. He ends up recovering territory from both Spain and Britain over the course of his terms in office. He maintained a stable northwest frontier, even in the midst of rebellion. He managed to incorporate Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee as brand new states, added three ones to the Union. And by the time we get to the election of 1796, it becomes the very first competitive one between two political parties. Okay. Federalists end up choosing the vice president, John Adams, as their candidate. And Thomas Pinckney runs as a Federalist candidate as well, although he doesn't get chosen here. 
Federalists, though, again, they're already under fire for all the unpopular taxes that Hamilton has laid against them, right? All the government spending and potential abuse of power, right? We have people, again, who think that all these laws that have been put into place have not been done with the consent of the people. And Adams himself is labeled as a monarchist because, remember, Adams is a Federalist. He has this idea that there are, quote unquote, better men who are going to be able to actually you know, take control of the country and run it. Okay? And in some cases, he is referred to as his rotundity okay, because he's kind of a short, round guy. Okay? He's kind of like the penguin from Batman. And the Republicans end up choosing Thomas Jefferson. Okay? Uh, Jefferson already has a... Uh, history of doing what the Republicans want, right? He is, uh, he's again located in the South. He's a plantation owner. He embodies everything that they want. Um, and Aaron Burr, who eventually becomes uh, Jefferson's vice president over time, uh, is a, a New York attorney who is very, has a very bad reputation here. Uh, he runs as a Republican as well, okay? but he actually does not get the nomination. Jefferson, meanwhile, has got all kinds of labels attached to him, just like John Adams has uh, labels attached to him. And Jefferson is labeled as indecisive, he's French-loving, and that he is an atheist warmonger, right? People already don't like all of the ideas that he embodies either. And Adams, of course, wins the election here. He becomes the second president. And this is a very bizarre situation, too, because we actually have Thomas Jefferson becoming vice president, okay? So... In terms of something as recent as the 2016 election, this would have been like if Donald Trump becomes president and Hillary Clinton becomes his vice president. Okay, it's something that seems like a match made in hell. <laughs> okay, just for the for, for you know for what we know today. Um, at the time, again, this was another thing that was considered to be very bizarre, but it was considered as a way to unite politics. Right, it was a peacemaking solution here, um, and again, would be completely unheard of today considering just how violent uh, politics has actually become. Um, and now the Federalists have control of not only the executive branch, but also both houses of Congress. Okay? So again, this firmly cements this as the Federalist era. Okay? So it's not until Jefferson actually comes along later on that we get a break from the Federalists. And in terms of Adams' administration, um, as in terms of him being a president and an individual in general, He's considered to be very vain and stubborn, right? He doesn't really want to listen to what anyone else says. He's a very combative leader, but he's a good political theorist. You remember, Adams is one who actually uh, was involved in the Constitutional Convention. He's the one who authors the state constitution of Massachusetts and is considered to be the hardest working member of the Continental Congress. Remember, he's been in there from the very beginning. He also has a record as a foreign diplomat as well, right? Remember, Washington doesn't even have this uh, in, in hand, right? Washington himself is a soldier, okay? And so Adams is really the first um, politician that we have as a president. And remember, he does not like the idea of a democracy. He thinks that it should be left to, quote-unquote, better men to run the country, okay? If we have the common people running things, they're going to end up causing all kinds of chaos. And so in 1797, America is in the midst of a quasi-war with France at this point due to Jay's Treaty coming out. And what this basically means is we're not really in an open war with France, but France has already gotten wind of the fact that we're doing business um, with their enemies, with Great Britain. Okay? And so they're, they're threatening to do all kinds of things to us. Um, we're, we're, we're in their sights, so to speak. And French and British navies navies both are beginning to impress sailors into service. Okay? They're beginning to capture ships and all kinds of stuff. Um, so really, we're, we're caught in the middle of a crossfire here, and we're, we've made enemies on both sides. French end up capturing over 300 ships uh, during this particular period, and they finally break diplomatic ties with America. Okay? And this is, this is a bad situation. You know, only 20 years before, we were signing a treaty with them saying we were going to be perpetual allies. And here we go, it's gone completely belly up. And so now the Federalists and the Republicans are very, very divided over this. You know, should we go to war with France or not? Remember, Jefferson still has this idea of supporting the Republicans. He supports France as an idea, right? Supports what the French Revolution has done. And he ends up falling out with John Adams. And the two of them don't actually reconcile until one of them is actually on their deathbed. 
Okay. Um, I, I believe uh, Jefferson actually ends up dying first, and then John Adams dies not too long thereafter, just within a few months. Um, one of the most unpopular things that Adams actually does during his presidency uh, comes two years in when he signs what are called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Okay. And uh, this is a very, very Federalist-driven um, set of laws. This is something that is very characteristic, I should say, of the Federalist Party and really of a monarchy in many ways. Um, it says that the president has the power to violate civil liberties and stamp out criticism of his administration. Okay, So if people start to speak out against Adams' administration, then Adams can have them arrested. Okay. So this is becoming something, again, more and more like an autocracy um, and uh, potentially a dictatorship. Okay. So this is, this is really big writing on the wall for a lot of people. Um, it limits freedom of speech in the press uh, concerning what is referred to as, quote, false, scandalous, and malicious material. So um, by modern standards, if the Alien and Sedition Acts were, were put into place here, a lot of people would be uh, arrested at this point, right, in, in the 21st century, because politics and the media end up quarreling with each other so much these days. Right? So to, to imagine something like this happening now, this would be a major, major um, national incident. Um, and more and more hostility begins to come out against the French and the Irish in particular, because once they actually end up coming to America, they become Republicans. Okay? They end up going to the South, going to start farms of their own. And so they're not really supporting um, the Federalists anymore. And so the Federalists don't want them in the country now. Okay? And they go so far as to even extend the Naturalization Act. Okay? In other words, you no longer are able to become a citizen after five years. You now have to wait 14 years. And finally, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions are passed in 1798 as well. And this ends up kind of um, counteracting the Alien and Sedition Acts, okay? It says that it's an infringement on constitutional rights, which it is, okay? It violates the First Amendment. Uh, and it also calls on state legislatures to, uh, to reject any kind of um, act of Congress that violates this, okay? So this is kind of pitting state governments against the federal governments again. Okay. So Republicans in particular in the South start to look at this as an infringement, not only on individual rights, but also on states' rights. Okay. So again, it's kind of an age-old battle between the federal government and state governments. And again, directly pits Thomas Jefferson against John Adams here. Now in 1800, John Adams finally manages to broker a settlement with Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. And Bonaparte uh, is kind of the, the dark horse in the midst of all this, because when the French Revolution is still going on uh, and, you know, the, the armies of Prussia and Austria are, are, you know, beginning to invade France, France is at war with Britain, Napoleon Bonaparte rises up and overthrows the French Republic and establishes a dictatorship of himself as, as emperor. Okay. And suddenly the U.S. drops all demands for reparation concerning its ships. Okay. Now that Napoleon is in control, Napoleon has stepped into this power vacuum and has taken over a, a massive swath of Central Europe. Um, most of the territory that he ends up controlling during his uh, reign ends up being uh, basically the equivalent of what Nazi Germany takes over in, 19, in the 1940s. Okay. Uh, French agreed to end all military alliances with the United States. They just kind of cut off ties. They don't really hold grudges. They just cut off ties. And the election of 1800 becomes a very decisive one. Okay? Um, this is the first time that we have an election where two political parties are now completely separate from one another. Okay? We don't, we're not going to try to band together for the common good anymore. We're going to be diametrically opposed. Okay? And it pits a, a president against a vice president for the first time. Okay? Because again, we have John Adams as a Federalist running again, and we have Thomas Jefferson as a Republican running for office again. Jefferson and Burr are chosen as the Republican candidates. Okay, Jefferson as president, at, uh, Aaron Burr as vice president. And Adams ends up becoming nominated by the Federalists again for re-election, despite the fact that he has a very poor reputation. Okay, he's made a, 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 a mockery out of the presidency, basically, at this point. People view him as being a diva, right? Um, they, a lot of people don't want anything to do with him. And Aaron Burr initially tries to run as uh, the Republican presidential candidate and refuses to withdraw his candidacy 
um, after he and Jefferson tie for nomination. And the House of Representatives is the one that has to step in and chooses Jefferson over Burr because Burr has a very bad reputation here. Um, and initially, Burr actually tries to stir up civil war. This as it sounds. Uh, and even at one point, there are whispers that he might try to assassinate uh, uh, Jefferson, although that, of course, never comes to fruition. The Judici Judiciary Act of 1801 is uh, John Adams' last gasp as president here and is trying to, is kind of like his way of trying to sabotage what uh, his successor is going to end up uh, facing. Uh, it's his last ditch effort to give the Federalists control over the judicial system. Okay? Uh, sets up 16 federal circuit courts okay? and reduces the number of Supreme Court justices from six to five. Okay? So basically we have one open seat now on the Supreme Court at this point. And if Jefferson tries to appoint a new one, okay, then we have a Republican potentially in the Supreme Court. But if we close that door on that, then the judicial branch is going to be Federalist. Okay? So again, it's John Adams trying to basically keep a foot in the door. But the Republicans, beginning with Thomas Jefferson, are victorious in president, presidential elections for the next 24 years. Okay? So the next six presidents that we have, uh, even those who repeat, end up being Republicans. Okay? So from this point forward now, we're getting into the 19th century, and we can begin to look at um, what is called the early republic. Okay? So I'll see you all next time.